Thank you so much for uh, inviting me. Uh, my job tonight is just to give the update on the status of crayfish in Lake Michigan through 2017. This talk was prepared by Dave Warner, who does the acoustic survey in Lake Michigan, but it's a multi-agency project because we have cooperation and collaboration from the Michigan DNR, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, as well as, well as the uh, Little Traverse Bay bands of Ottawa Indians. And there'll be a couple of new types of figures that Dave's done this year. He's doing his best to try to combine the acoustics results with the bottom troll that you'll see in a couple of slides. So just a quick introduction. You all know that Lake Michigan has gone through many changes and continues to go through changes even now. Invasive species have had a major influence on the lake, first with the sea lamprey and alewife invasions, and then more recently through the invasions of the tricinid mussels, round gobies, some small invertebrates like the spiny water flea. Chlorophyll in primary production, which is the base of the food web, have declined in the lake. And some of the native species are either at low levels or, or just gone. This includes the small amphipod diapariah, which is a native that is an important food for fish, but also the lake herring or cisco, kayai uh, emerald shiner. And the prey fish remain well below the fish community objectives, which has led to decreases in the stocking reduction. A few notable dates to keep in mind when looking at the prey fish data are 1965, that's the first year that of the major stocking of salmon and trout in the lake. 1966, the peak abundance of air life in Lake Michigan, and those two events are definitely related. 1981, the first year that the phosphorus was reduced, so the first year that reductions uh, in phosphorus loading to the lake occurred was 1981. So up to that time, primary production in Lake Michigan was increasing. 1986, first year of the BKD, or bacterial kidney disease outbreak in Chinook salmon. And then 1990s uh, is when the zebra mussels came in. Nin 1993, they became established. 2004, quagga mussels became established. And then the late 90s, round gobies invaded the lake. The prey fish are important for a number of reasons within the Lake Michigan food web. One, uh, just right off the bat there, uh, they, some, some species are economically important, like rainbow smelt and bloater. The, they serve as a valuable food for the top predators. Chinook salmon is heavily reliant on alewife. Lake trout will eat alewife, and alewife is still the mainstay of their diet even now but they also eat uh, bloaters, sculpins, gobies. Many, many species are eating gobies nowadays, in fact, including whitefish, smallmouth bass, yellow perch, burbot, lake trout. There, there's a, there's a, a, an array of species that are feeding on round gobies now. They serve as a conduit of energy between invertebrates and the top predators, so they're feeding on invertebrates like zooplankton, and mices, and they, uh, they also can influence the zooplankton community structure. So in, in this talk, I'm going to just give a brief outline of the survey methodology, and then give the results for both surveys, the acoustics and bottom troll survey, for the species that are shared by uh, those two deer, namely alewife, bloater, and smelt and then get into the species that are mainly serve, uh, targeted by the bottom troll. And then just go over some really brief conclusions. So I think you've all seen this slide before. It compares the bottom troll survey with the acoustic survey. Bottom troll survey on a lake-wide basis for USGS began in 73, has continued to this time. 
The acoustic survey started in 1992. There were five years during the 90s that each year the lake was surveyed, then a gap, but then it was resumed uh, for, from 2001 to the present time. Bottom trawl survey is during the day. It's done with a 39-foot head rope bottom trawl. Trawl is lowered, towed on bottom for 10 minutes, then the net is lifted and the catch is sorted. Uh, all the data get entered into a uh, computer database. There are a total of uh, approximately 70 bottom trawls done every year. The acoustics is done at night. It, it surveys the entire water column except for a couple of meters above where the, uh, where, where the uh, sensor is for the, uh, and also the last meter of the water column isn't, isn't really accurately uh, surveyed by the acoustics gear. The acoustics gear is accompanied by a midwater trawl so that the echoes picked up by the sonar gear can then be translated into, uh, broken down by species. So a midwater trawl is done with the acoustics, which is a, a trawl that's dragged more in the middle of the water column. And again, the species that are in common are the alewife bloater and rainbow smelt for both gear, but the trawl does pick up other bottom-dwelling species, including sculpins, round gobies, and uh, sticklebacks. So moving right into the data, Dave has now combined the results from the acoustic survey with the bottom trawl survey. The Bottom trawl survey is the dark line, the black line. The acoustic survey is the dotted blue line that you see here. And this slide is for the young of year alewife. These are the alewives that are less than 100 millimeters or about four inches in length. So it's this year's crop. And you can see that uh, there were good year classes uh, according to the acoustics in 95, 2010, 2005. The year class in 2017 is not that great according to the acoustics gear. It, it looks relatively weak. Now, moving on to the yearling and older, or YAO alewife. The bottom trawl shows the highest density of alewife uh, of the young yearling and older alewife in 1973. Our, our agency did do some trawling, although it was limited during the 60s, and we can say that at the peak level, the peak level at 66 had a density that's, that was roughly four times higher than the density in 73 that you see here. So if we bring this over to the left, we're talking about even higher densities. So the alewife did drop dramatically between 66 and, say, this very low period, 83, 85, uh, we're talking about uh, many fold, maybe on the order of 20 fold in, in that kind of range. During most of that time, primary production in Lake Michigan was increasing, so you could not attribute that decline to any kind of bottom-up effect. Uh, again, I mentioned that in 81 was the first year that phosphorus was reduced. So primary production in the lake was was actually increasing during most of that time. In 86, we see a, an increase in alewife abundance. That's the same year that the BKD outbreak occurred. So the alewife population is responding to a, re, a slight reduction in the predation by actually increasing. And alewife stay at a higher level from 86 all the way through the rest of the 80s into the into the, through the 90s and into the early 2000s before they then again drop due to increased amount of predation. BKD had run its course by the early 2000s, but there was also a new influx of natural recruitment, uh, some from Lake Huron even, and predation again became very intense. And you can see that the alewives have continued to their decline, according to both gear, to the present time, more dramatic with the bottom trawl. In fact, 2017 was the lowest level for yearling and older, but even according to the acoustics, we have low levels of alewives uh, in 2017. So if we look at the age structure according to the bottom trawl, 
which is on the top panel, and the acoustics using the midboard control, we see that the alewife is dominated by age one and age two fish. This is a young population. There are some fours and fives, nothing older than a five. So the pattern of a truncated age structure or very short, a, a, a low amount of ages continues for the ninth year in a row. Before 2009, we would get age, ages seven, eight, nine, typically, we haven't gotten anything older than an age six for nine years now. And some years, not, nothing older than an age five. Pattern continues to the present time. A young alewife population out there. According to the predator-prey model, the, this is the number of age zero alewife according to the predator-prey model in Lake Michigan in the fall. So this is an index of year class strength. You can see that there is no overall trend. Actually, if there is a trend, it's actually increasing through time. So according to the model, the ability of alewives to reproduce has not been impaired up to the present time. So even with the reduction in growth and condition, alewives are still able to produce uh, and no reduction yet in their ability to reproduce up, up until 2017. So if we look at the Spatial distribution, this is a map that Dave has prepared. Uh, I, it needs a little bit of explaining because <laughs> uh, it's kind of a complicated map, but the pink dots are the acoustics estimates of, of the number of larger alewife or yearling and older alewife. The bigger the circle, the higher the density. And then the black crosses there are the midwater trawls that didn't produce any alewives at all. So you'll see there's quite a bit of black on, on the slide. These are areas where the midwater trawl was dragged, but there were no alewives in there. The yellow circles are from the bottom trawl. The bigger the circle, the more, uh, the higher the density of yearling and older alewife. And the black dot is where no alewives were caught. So you can see that there are, the alewives are still patchy. There's a lot of areas where no alewives are caught. Uh, the bottom trawl, alewives are caught at all nine or all seven ports, except for Saugata. But it is a patchy distribution of, according to both here. For small alewives, for whatever reason, most of the small alewives were caught according to the acoustics or, or surveyed in the southern part of the lake. Uh, the bottom trawl had a few at, at, uh, at Frankfurt, and maybe uh, that's about it. So very few young of year alewives caught in the bottom trawl in 2017. Moving on to small or young of the year rainbow smelt. Again, the black line is for bottom trawl. The blue line is for acoustics. There's a pretty good match between the two gear. Uh, in year, we see a, a drop in the young of year, but then uh, after 2000, some years we see a, a pickup uh, according to both gear. 2017, actually, we see a, uh, an increasing trend for both gear for young of the year rainbow smelt. Now, moving on to the larger smelt or yearling and older smelt, according to the bottom trawl, uh, smelt were holding up okay uh, through the 80s. But then a big drop in rainbow smelt abundance between 92 and 2001. Acoustics similarly show a drop in abundance between the 90s and the 2000s. So both gear are showing a drop in smelt abundance in the lake between the 90s and, and, and the 2000s. We're at low levels presently for rainbow smelt according to both gear. The, this trend is a difficult one to explain because we know that there was more predation on the smelt during a period in the 80s than there was in the 90s, but the big drop in smelt abundance occurred in the 90s. And here's the map for smelt, uh, the larger smelt in the lake. According to the acoustics, most of the larger smelt are in the north, but the bottom trawl did pick up some larger smelt at Saugatuck this year, but you see a lot of uh, black in the, in the southern half of the lake. 
Here are the, here are the younger year rainbow smelt distribution. And according to the acoustics, they were, they were scattered all over the lake. Uh, bottom trawl had them at Manistique, Sturgeon Bay, Ludington, uh, according to the bottom trawl. Okay, uh, the small bloaters show a lot of production of small bloaters in, in the 80s, according to the bottom trawl. Again, that's in black. Um, there's a period where both gear were uh, showing low abundance through the 92 to 2001 period. And then we start picking up some young of year production, uh, according to the acoustics, uh, a lot beginning in the mid 2000s. But even the bottom trawl now is picking up uh, relatively high numbers in the last two years, even comparable to the 80s. Now the large bloaters show a peak according to the bottom trawl in 89 and then a decline during the 90s. We still have not seen that young of year production that we saw in the 2000s translate into a sustained trend upward, although both gear do show an increase between 2016 and 2017. Looking at the bloater distributions, they're basically all over the lake according to both gear. This is for the large bloater, but the same is uh, true for small bloater as well. They're, they're all over the lake. Now lo looking at the bottom trawl estimates for deep order sculpins, we see a, a deep water sculpins were doing okay, and then a drop started begin, uh, began in the 2006, and they just steadily dropped and are, are at low levels. We think that this drop is in part due to a movement of these fish to even deeper water than what the bottom trawl surveys are. are typically, our deepest toes are 110 meter. In the last five years, we've been doing an additional set of toes at 128 meters, and we see more fish caught at that 128 meters than all of the other shallower toes combined. So part of this drop, we think, is due to a movement to deeper water. The slimy sculpin, which is the blue line, is mainly responds to predation by juvenile lake trout. With the increase in lake trout stocking, we see a, a steady decline in slimy sculpins in recent years. Uh, just a plot for the nine-spine stickleback, which is the blue line. They were at really high levels, relatively high levels in the 90s, but they've dropped uh, from uh, the late 2000s to the present time. Round gopies have uh, really shown a big increase in the 2000s, but now it looks like they've leveled off in abundance in the lake. So now, if we look at the, compare the two surveys, the bottom trawl with the acoustics, even though the results are not identical, they, in general, they do uh, uh, show similar patterns, and they do give a good overall picture and complement each other in that one gear is, is better for certain types of fish than the other. They give a more complete picture of the prey fish dynamics in Lake Michigan. There is general agreement between both gear. They both are indicating that prey fish biomass in the lake is at a low level compared to what was in the lake during the 90s or even earlier. They both are showing that in recent times we're at a low level of prey fish biomass. Here is the total prey fish biomass according to the bottom trawl. So this is lumping all seven species of prey fish into one graph, and you do see that in 2017, we're at a low level, although it's come up a little bit in recent time. We're at about 15 kilotons in 2017, which, which is the fourth lowest, but not the lowest level according to the bottom trawl. The acoustics show that 2017 is also a relatively low year. I, I think it's about the third lowest and much lower levels in recent years than what was in the lake in the 90s. One other thing that Dave wanted to comment on, and that is the divergence in the estimates of alewife abundance in the last two years, uh, even a wider divergence between both gear. So in 
in uh, the last three or four years, you can see a big divergence between the alewife estimate of what's uh, for the bottom trawl estimate for alewife and the acoustics estimate. Uh, a quite a wide divergence. We're talking about uh, a factor of uh, over 10, maybe uh, 20 or so. Whereas before 2014, the difference was only a, a two or three fold level. So whatever reason, there's even a greater divergence between the two year for alewife in the last four years. Whereas for bloater, uh, it's been fairly even. In fact, in some years, the bottom trawl will yield a higher estimate of bloater than the acoustics. For smelt, the, it's been a steady six-fold difference. And this is expected because the smelt is a more pelagic fish and a lot more readily available to the acoustics than the bottom trawl. So in conclusion, both surveys, the acoustics and the bottom trawl, are showing low prey fish biomass estimates uh, for 2016 and 2017 compared to the levels that were in the lake in the 90s or even earlier. And according to the acoustics, oops, the, for the last uh, seven or eight years, there's been one really strong gear class to 2010, a couple of uh, average and then five below average for alewife. So that's the year class strength of alewife. And I think that's all I have for slides. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'll be glad to answer questions.